And hi, I'm Cindy, and welcome to Pearls of Liberty, February 4th, 2012. We realize that this is Super Bowl weekend, and we're probably going to watch the game, but we're not absolutely sure which two teams are playing. <laughs> so we do love America, even though we're not passionate about football. No. And, uh, <laughs> and may the best team win. And uh, actually, this week... Uh, has seemed a little light on news for whatever reason doesn't seem like there are a lot of significant occurrences I'm kind of hoping that there's a lot going on behind the scenes or underground and good things and that very soon we will hear about some breakthroughs uh, but for the time being there was one piece of news that was disappointing this week that I know Don wants to mention and that is the fact that Ron Paul has been left out of the CPAC meeting so far. CPAC 2012 did not invite Ron Paul. He's won the last two CPACs. That's the Conservative Political Action Committee, the portion of the GOP that tries to vet conservative candidates, and Ron Paul won it the last two years, but he's not invited in 2012. And, of course, he's the presidential candidate. What does that say? That says our system is the, well, I should say, the, the GOP is very, very controlled at the top, does not really want the person or people that have the grassroots support. So another indication that we're living in a very, very rigged system. Yes, some may write. And uh, another disappointing news item that we're aware of is that uh, I think that we'd even stated last week that and based on what what the news was saying at that time that Obama was not going to be allowed on the ballot in Georgia because of his failure to appear at his hearing regarding his birth certificate however I guess that has changed now and he's going to be on the ballot. yeah in Georgia yeah, the, the preliminary indications we talked about last week where the judge was uh, looking at the evidence uh, that indicated Obama was not eligible with, in a very favorable light. In other words, he wasn't dismissing it, he was considering it, and it looked like he was going to make a decision to not allow Obama to be on the ballot. Um, but he ended up reversing himself, and I just got done reading a little bit more about that in detail, and basically he ended up citing in his judgment a couple of cases from some other states that really did not rise to the level of uh, the presidential candidates and uh, status for being a president. It had to do with uh, natural citizen and citizenship, and and but not with presidential candidates. And there's other in laws that could have been cited of a higher level nature that he chose not to cite because they would have contradicted his ruling. So it looks to me like somebody got to this guy and said, look, you can't let this happen, we'll ruin your career, or something along those lines. It, that's the only way I can make sense out of this. The guy was making sense in the beginning, and now he's just kind of grasping at straws and putting in some, uh, saying that that evidence really isn't evidence, things like the the birth certificate copy and the, the, the fake birth certificate in Hawaii, which we all know was a digital forgery. You know, such digital copies didn't exist. His so-called birth certificate in Hawaii doesn't look anything like those that are numbered in the near vicinity of it from Hawaii. It just doesn't make any sense. So it, uh, it's all and, and all of that even ignores the Indonesia stuff, which is the slam dunk. So I'm not going to go into the details here, but boy, it's just a rigged process from A to Z, and everybody's bought off. And regardless of the evidence and the findings, um, he was summoned and had a failure to appear, correct? Correct. And we actually have a friend who is currently in jail in California, uh, right here in the Bay Area for a failure to appear in court. Wow. So that's the same exact thing that, you know, Obama's done. Yeah, what we're really talking about is 
selective enforcement of the law and that's one of the hallmarks of tyranny is when be the people that are the power brokers don't have to obey the laws that the rest of the people obey they get a free pass and they can do whatever they want that's just not the way a true republic rule of law should operate sure and one little tidbit that I'm not sure if we can be encouraged by this, but the New York Times lost $40 million for their operating year 2011. And I suppose it's encouraging because it shows the disdain in which people hold the mainstream media and how that industry is failing. However, it's also disappointing news because <laughs> the evil elite have enough money to prop up a failing enterprise. So what, what was your response to that? It's, it's another too big to fail thing. There's no way that the powers that be are going to let the, the dinosaur media giants such as the New York Times and all of the Alphabet Soup networks and everything else which is a private corporation. There's no way that they're going to let those fail. They're, they've been pumping money into those behind the scenes with you know, CIA vetted anchor people and reporters and phony stories and whatnot for a long time ever since Project Mockingbird the, and the gobbling up of corporations in this vertical integration. There hasn't really been a truly free press in America until the internet and now we're seeing a free press emerge and so what we do have is this battle between the f free internet reporting and these dying giants and we hope they're dying I mean they're dying definitely in terms of whether or not they're real news they're not real news uh, except occasionally no, no propaganda is ever 100 percent false it's just often what they don't tell you, what they don't report on that creates the false picture. So this is more fascism is really what it is. This is when money is diverted into things that are not really making money in order to serve the purposes of the state. That's what the New York Times has become. It's become a fascist entity. So I'm hoping that liberals that might listen to this would no longer think of the New York Times as this wonderful bastion of the left which is for the little guy it's really an arm of the state nowadays and the state will keep it propped up by whatever means necessary that is deeply unfortunate so of course as we've stated before we hope that people will use the internet to full extent while it's still available and we pray that uh, internet freedom will continue and I'm sure you all do as well. We, uh, we subscribed to Benjamin Fulford's blog and this week w was mildly interesting, no real dramatic information there this week, but they are, st we saw a uh, YouTube video that was in Japanese, you have to re read the subtitles, that was posted this week that the struggle is is definitely ongoing between the white dragons and the actually what Benjamin Fulford calls Satanists and I'm not even sure that Benjamin Fulford is a Christian so for him to use that term seems uh, pretty strong to me but that that is certainly a good description yeah the yeah both both the blog and the Fulford and the, the general um view of reality that comes from Benjamin Fulford in the the Asian camp battling against the Anglo-American New World Order Empire it's it really is very interesting there are some nuances that seem like they don't quite add up but then nothing's ever 100 percent uh, vetted and he's just a mouthpiece of some people that have decided to use them. I haven't completely ruled out the theory that Full Forward and the White Dragons are just another problem reaction solution where the, the West bankers look really really bad and the the Eastern Asian guys that have these stockpiles of gold are the the new good guys but they have these 
grandiose plans that can enslave as well as the, the little guy. I haven't, you know, what I've heard Fulford talk about in, in his blog and is that these guys, the white dragons, etc., want to use these major large corporations and large military forces for good, for peacekeeping, that's all well and good. But there's some of the projects that really don't quite make sense, that kind of, kind of seem like make work and they, you know, kind of seem like they're incompletely thought out, incompletely researched, that they're just kind of being thrown out there to give you the feeling that they have some ideas that they want to move forward with, but in my opinion it's, it's kind of half-baked. So I'm wondering how real that is. I mean, I hope it's real. When he talks, when Fulford talks about Satanists, I, I will contrast that with the way that that uh, Alex Jones talks about Satanists. Then he's had um, Fritz Springmeier on this week, both as a, as a guest on the road, morning radio program and on the nightly news portion. <clears throat> One of the things that Alex says about Satanists, and I and I tend to agree with this, is that the Using the term Satanist for the Illuminati is a little bit uh, inappropriate because they're not worsh really worshipping a dark entity. That's something that, that the low-level Anton LaVey Church of Satan guys do. These major world power brokers are not really so much worshipping an entity but using these tools of control. And there's a difference there. They're they're into very much very much dark stuff, very much control stuff. And yeah, you could say that they're Satanists, except for the fact that it's it's kind of beyond that. If you want to say put it that way, it's even worse than Satanism. There's stuff that they do that's just it's totally unspeakable. And so it's not like the parlor trick, black magic the guy with the horns kind of thing. This is uh, just really, really dark. There's no cutesy to it at all. So, um, in that vein, I kind of think that some of Fulford's stuff is a little naive. That I mean, maybe that's just a way of communicating that you have to use a term like Satanists and you really can't fully describe how wicked they are. And he certainly does get upset about them. And it certainly is good that he wants to Put all these guys in jail. He has said, and this was a very encouraging thing, that World War III will never happen because these guys and that have the the understanding of who the power brokers are will take these guys out before they ever allow World War III to happen. Well, that's a bold statement. That's pretty encouraging that they're not going to let that happen. Yet we don't know how it's all going to pan out. So, and whether or not this is another version of problem reaction solution. Rothschild is supposedly, from a previous Fulford statement, involved in helping to set up the reunification of North Korea and South Korea, which Fulford's talking about this major realignment within Asia. So, if there does come to be some kind of a new banking center for all of Asia and a more unified Asia that very well could um, form anything that's formed in reaction to something dark tends to be dark itself so that's the danger that I'm concerned about although there are many encouraging signs and you know when you've got this th battle going on it's hard not to choose sides, so yeah, we'll vote against the Satanists, okay, whether the Satanists are bad. <laughs> but here's, here's kind of a parallel illustration I'll, I'll mention, that Abraham Lincoln saw that the, the European bankers were trying to destroy the United States. He wanted to keep the United States unified so because he knew that they were playing a divide and conquer game against the United States. So he holds the Union together, but he uses tyrannical methods to do it. And it, and we there still was a divide and conquer that happened and the United States was never the same. So it hardly ever works to get big enough to fight a big enemy. It's almost like the only real successful way to fight a big evil behemoth is to 
stay small. And that's like Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And it's purposely decentralized, it's purposely not with a, a strong hierarchy, it's purposely empowering the little guy, and that's all the stuff that we see in the American Liberty Movement. And I, I, that's why I love that stuff, because that stuff is going in the right direction. Yeah, you can focus on one candidate, as like Ron Paul, as being the mouthpiece for that, but everybody involved pretty much knows it's not about Ron Paul wanting power, it's about giving power back to the little guy. So when we have these major power blocks that are trying to duke it out, that whole thing may be going in the wrong direction. Sure. It's, you've got to stay small like the hobbits throwing the ring into the cracks of doom, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that what, what I just want to add just a little bit about the um, the Satanists. Uh, I think that um, Don was trying to clarify uh, these people are not gods. They don't go around wearing black and heavy eye, dark eye makeup, and all that. It's not. It's not theater. It's not drama. Uh, it's human sacrifice. It's. Uh, it's many of the things that we that we think about when we think about Satanism, but it's it's not the theatrical side because, it, and I, I hope a lot of people got to hear uh, Fritz Sp Springmeier on Alex Jones this week, and if you didn't, wow, just, just surf YouTube and and listen to Fritz. He's, his heart is amazing. The new uh, ones, the videos since he got out of prison, and even his old stuff is great. But um, the man has just really gone through a a holy process, and he's so his heart is so tender. Uh, but he's he describes you know just these terrible um, practices. But th that's by night. By day, these people wear suits and ties, and they're very uh, f philanthropic. Some of them are full time philanthropists, and they, they appear to be helping mankind and and building foundations and universities and, uh, and, and institutions that appear to be helping people. So that's where the confusion comes in. And I, th I think that's what you, what you wanted to kind of clarify. And, and that is uh, one of the things that Fritz talked about that where he, he, he helps people to see the elites they, the way they really are. He, he used scripture for his analogy, and I'll go back there too. In the New Testament, the power structure in the among the Jewish people was between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and you could consider that like the left and the right today it's this dualism of these battling forces and what Fritz helped us to see is that these are the people that society looks up to. These are the great speakers, these are the orators, these are the thinkers, these are the successful people and these are the people that oppose the agenda of Christ. These are the people that oppose real freedom. These are the people that are trying to stay in control and are doing very dark things to, to stay that way. And that's, that might be helpful for people to think of the power structure today is similar to the power structure of Christ. And I know that Cindy actually had some thoughts about that, the state of the church as uh, today as compared to then also. I, I believe that the church is as far from Jesus in many respects as the Pharisees were from Abraham. And, and we often think of uh, the Jewish faith coming from Moses, and that's the institutional aspect of it. But the, uh, the relationship with the Lord started with Abraham and was, was passed down. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative against Moses. And I could say the church, that the church is as far from Jesus as, uh, as what the Pharisees were from Moses. But actually, I just, I just want to go back even farther because uh, our relationship with the Lord is based on faith. And it's, it's not based on works. 
And Abraham also had that relationship that is said of Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That it's not it's not about what we do and, 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 and what we can build or what we can give. It's it's about Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that's that's the relationship that that we've lost in many respects in the church, I think, is that, that simple faith. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to get if you've been really involved in church like we have, and now we're actually probably more identify with liberty and truth movements than the church itself, so we get a, a little bit of a view from a, a, a different perspective, and it's, uh, it's pretty eye-opening because you can see the blind spots, you can see what you weren't seeing before, and it's pretty huge. There's, there's a, a great deal of waking up that, that needs to happen, and oh, that there was a, a book review that I read by N.T. Wright, and uh, N.T. Wright is a British theologian uh, living and, uh, and pretty popular among those that like to think about things, and, and he has a, a book out which is promoting the idea that Jesus was actually very political, and this is something that's been on my heart uh, for some time, probably over a year now, is that a lot of the time we just don't see how political Jesus was. And it's not like he's within the system, but he's outside of the system because he sees that the system itself is oppressing the people. And the I believe that Jesus purposely picked the phrase, the kingdom of God, to pick a fight, so to speak, with the kingdoms of this world. You could easily say, oh, separation of church and state, we're not a threat to you, we just want people to learn how to live lives so they'll be beneficial to the system. That's the stance the church takes today, and I believe that it's way off. I believe Jesus was actually confronting the system <clears throat> by purposely using terminology that forced them to see him as a threat. Well, we did see some uh, interesting films. It's actually been a couple of weeks since we had a pro culture segment because we left it out last week on um, being on the road. Uh, last night we watched, I'm, I'll begin where, with the present and work back. We watched Alphaville last night. Uh, I didn't actually intently watch the whole thing because it's French and with English captions. And I, so I, I was working on my laptop and I know I missed some dialogue. But it was kind of a 1984 kind of a vibe uh, story about about trying to reclaim liberty is from 1968. Yeah, it's a future dystopic film that was made in the 1960s. It's made in black and white. It's it's a French film, like Cindy said, and you have a a French take on a 1984ish society run by a computer. And this was the early days of computers, so you have this big room with these big uh, chest-like computers and uh, tape drives on the wall and that kind of thing and these were the computers that were running the society. Various ideas about what this, this dystopic society looked like. Everything was very dark, everything was very authoritarian too, but everything also had a lot of seduction into it, things to try to rope you in. The women were, uh, were level three seductresses and things like that. So there was a man that that came from the outer countries, I think it was called, and uh, he was going to try to uh, get the computer and take it down, that type of thing. And I think the value in the movie was mostly to, to for me, to get a, a perspective on how there was a warning of what we're seeing emerge today, and it, what we're seeing today has a much glitzier overlay because the stark darkness would be so obvious if tyranny were ruled out that way. But it's a it's a useful picture because it cuts through all the glitziness and you see the the control nature of the nineteen eighty four style society for what it is. Rather dark, rather depressing. Uh, we also watched a very encouraging film the world's fastest Indian and that was 
uh, just a great, inspiring, based on a true story, uh, what a man can accomplish if he really sets his mind to it. Yeah, Anthony Hopkins plays this New Zealand guy who in the, I think it's the early 60s, maybe late 50s, early 60s, true story, goes to uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats to, to race his Indian motorcycle. And this is a highly, highly souped up motorcycle. Before he goes, they show him taking on in races these young motorcycle thugs and, and he's riding this, this thing in, basically in a prone position and, uh, and he just shoots past them. And this is a machine that it's stock horsepower, whatever, it's, it's pretty standard and uh, it's, it's top speed is 55 miles an hour or something extremely tame but he's he's just uh, a skilled mechanic and has made it zoom like a rocket ship and and puts a rocket ship body on it and takes it to the Bonneville Salt Flats and he thinks that he can just show up there and race this thing and there's this huge event and it's amazing because you it, it's it's a story about and it's a true story about how to live your dream and his whole philosophy is if you don't live your dream, what's the point of living? And, and he's going to do this thing, and he does it, and you keep thinking this guy's going to die, this guy's going to die, but I'm not going to ruin it for you except to say he doesn't die. And it's, uh, it's very, very inspiring, and the reception that he gets at the Bonneville Salt Flats, it's, it's very heartening, and it's all, you also realize what we've lost because there's a tremendous amount of innocence in that in the cowboy days of the the, the early speed racing and now it would be virtually impossible to duplicate something like that now we have to learn how to leave open doors for the unknown and all this stuff that we do and I just really enjoyed it Anthony Hopkins did a great job of portraying this character well without getting too much into probing the depths of mind control and that whole evil uh, I, I think uh, in, in slavery, I believe a lot of uh, top athletes are actually owned by individuals or corporations now, and I, I think they want to they want to remove that uh, possibility for someone to come up, some unknown to come up, uh, just because, like you said, they just want to maintain control over everything, but. Uh, you, you know, he, this movie does it does show that if you if you have a passion, and one of the things I thought was great was the fact that he was much older when he began this, and it was something he had wanted to do for his entire life. And finally, I don't know what his age was. It seemed as if he were were at least sixty, and possibly in his seventies. Yeah. So they're they're asking him about all this. Uh... Oh, are there any other things we should know about? And he goes, oh yeah, and, and I have a bad heart. <laughs> and these people are just going, oh my goodness, this guy's out of his mind. But it's just, he's not letting anything stop him. And he, he just has this calm, he just, I'm going to do this kind of an attitude. It's not like he's, you know that he's, a li he's, he's not quite normal, but he's not crazy either. He's just doing his dream. I loved it. No, it was it was really good. I like Tom Horn because that I've seen it before, but I had forgotten it. And this is a real uh, one of the last cowboys, played by Steve McQueen, does a great portrayal. And this is a guy that's hired to help stop the rustlers of the cattlemen in around the turn of the century. And he, they know that he's going to kill people outside of the law. He does kill people outside of the law almost exclusively in self-defense and then he's he's framed and and just how he managed the situation and this is a guy that just loves the wildness of the wild west and he sees the corrupt ways of the law and you really see in this movie that the idea that morality means obeying the law is a completely false idea. And I found myself thinking about the times in the book of Judges where it says everyone did what's right in his own eyes and then God chastises the people through Samuel for wanting to have a king. And the modern mindset on is, is almost always that a form of government that says what's right and what's wrong is almost always better. But 
God put freedom in every man and, and woman's heart and wants us to live free. And you see in Tom Horn a character that so passionately wanted to live free and unencumbered and sees the law coming in and posing as a as this righteous thing which it's not and and then I won't even I won't give away the movie but uh, it, it confirms that, that the law is is not what it claims to be and that, that bad people often use the law to get what they want and masquerade as servants of righteousness. I, th I thought Snake Eyes was pretty interesting too. Snake Eyes was a Nicolas Cage film and a Gary Sinise is in it and it it's just kind of shows the different levels of evil. Uh, Nicolas Cage is a corrupt policeman but then he encounters somebody who seems to be a very just upright man who kind of remonstrates him for uh, being corrupt but you know you, you just watch this process and, and the corruption um, the real corruption runs much deeper than just some uh, policeman who takes bribes at times. Yeah, this is something we need to get through our heads and this movie helps us do that that Gary Sinise player a, a character is the the Dudley Do-Right appearances, but he's really the the bad guy. You'll find out not too far, not well, maybe about halfway through the movie. So it gave away a little bit. But this whole idea that we will recognize the bad people, and by being able to watch them on TV at you know 15 second spots uh, between dinner and our evening activities is just baloney. These people that are in the high powerful positions of society uh, live, are very, very good at portraying themselves as being honorable. The sad thing is, is that they're not. You need to get on the internet and really search out the powers that be, both parties. And there have been exposés, and you don't hear about them, but that's not all there is to it. So this movie is a great illustration of he, somebody who they try to use him, the Nicolas Cage character, but he is actually ends up being the good guy. Bad things happen to him in the process, and uh, the the I don't think the the real power brokers, the Gary Sinise character and who's behind him, ever really get fully exposed, do they? Uh, pretty much, yeah, they do, they do but um, a lot of them. Uh, die in the process so uh, it, it's it's it does get whitewashed yeah but the bad guys are exposed yeah so yeah well it's worth it from that perspective thank you for joining us this week and have a good week and pray for freedom and do you have any last words secure your heart to liberty